Well, yes, let me try it J U S T. Just, just. Right? And before you start the question, how come she's just, not Justina? That's for my father when next you see him. Today, I want to talk about entrepreneurship as the bedrock of a sustainable Africa. And I'm going to start by sharing a background story. 27 years ago, I was an eight-year-old girl standing in front of my mother's old wooden antique mirror. And as I stood in front of that mirror, I could remember very vividly just picturing myself interviewing the most successful people in the world. And as young as I was, I could remember relishing the satisfaction that came from just exploring what their thought patterns were like, just exploring how they thought and the principles that made them successful. But I was thinking about how could I earn a living even if I was a student. Take note, my parents were average. So yes, they could pay my school fees, they could do the basic things that I needed. But something inside of me realized that there was something more I could do than just getting an education out of the And so guess what this young lady did? I took my first school fees. I traveled to Lagos State. From Ilori, I went to University of Ilori. And I went into Idumota Market. I bought pretty jewelries, pretty underwears, and I traveled back to University of Illinois because there was something on my mind. I wanted to sell that, increase the amount of money that I had been given so that, hey, I could probably live a baby girl lifestyle at that time. Guess what happened when I went back to school? All the commentaries I got from the fine jewelries I thought I had bought was, ah, it's so nice, so it's beautiful. Nobody was willing to stake their hard-earned money for the very pretty jewelries I had spent my school fees doing. And take note, if you're in the audience or you're listening to this from anywhere in the world, don't try this at home. And after several weeks had passed by of moving from one dormitory to the other, trying to sell this product, the reality dawned on me that school had resumed, I hadn't paid my school fees. And as an African child, imagine what it felt for you to call your father and say, Daddy, I haven't paid my school fees. What happened after that is a story that you may find in one of my books. Fast forward to several years later, I was an undergrad, and then I finally graduated from the University of Illinois with a two-two degree in microbiology. And the reality of life truly dawned on me. But before then, I was to go serve in NYC. And as I was going, I started to ask myself, what can I project as a solution in NYC solution, even if I was going as a youth core member? And then I realized that there were young couples who were always complaining of the khaki-like rope, we call a belt. And so I thought about it, what about a makeshift solution? So we traveled down to a bar, we got belts, and we took them to NYC camp. Now, I'm not sure whether this is properly allowed, but I'm going to share it here. We took this to NYC camp, and in three days, I think I earned my first six figures as a copper. And three days later, I did the exact same thing because the demand was huge. At this time, my product was finished. So we ordered for more and then another six figures in another three days. So imagine what it meant that, okay, that means that entrepreneurship that I failed at my first attempt as a jambite, there's still something here that I could harness if I understood the principle of identifying a solution that people needed and are willing to pay for and enter into that hungry market. Stay with me. Several years after leaving NYC camp, as a copper who was in NYC camp, I went ahead to do my one-year NYC service. And after NYC, the harsh reality truly hits. There are no jobs. And I know you all know this. Our president just said it a few days ago. And I started to ask, I had two options. Go back home to sit with my parents and add up to the statistics of unemployed graduates. Or find something to do with myself in the marketplace. I chose the latter. And guess what I did? I recognized that while I was in NYC, as a youth core member, I was able to make several six figures. I decided this time around, I was going to go in fully to do this business. So I went into NYC, I, bought a, I got a shack. They call it a shade. I don't know what they call it now, right? So I rented a small kiosk. And instead of just doing the belts that I did, I added more things, Indomie, whatever you want to call it. And while I was doing all of this, as a fresh graduate, a pretty fresh graduate at that, 
I was doing this every day, showing up, rendering products and services to board call members and to those who were the supervisors. And in one of those days, one man walked into my store. As he asked me, good morning, young lady, what do you have? And I gave him all the things that were on the menu. As we're conversing, he looks at me and says, you are not supposed to be here. And I said, if that's a compliment, sir, thank you. He said, no, I mean it. You are not supposed to be here. What did you study? And so I told him. Three minutes down the line, he made phone calls, and right there and then, I got my first invite for the first interview with the first job I ever had in my life. These stories are interrelated. We're going somewhere. I traveled from the then Nassau State to Lagos State. I had my interview, and four weeks down the line, I got my first job with Diamond Bank. Four years into working as a banker, the restlessness that started as an undergrad and as a graduate kicked in again. And that restlessness is, though you have a paying job, maybe to some people their dream come true, for me there was a restlessness. And I started to ask, why is this restlessness here? And I started to ask soul-searching questions. What is within me that is crying for expression? And those questions began to birth all the things I represent here today. I've shared this story today, and somebody may be asking, why does this concern me? And here is the hard truth. We live in a world where majority of you are expecting to graduate from school and get the nicest jobs. But newsflash, Nigeria is waiting for you to come out and reduce the statistic of unemployment. That means seated in your hands are people who should be potential employers of labor because we depend on you to eradicate unemployment, or better still, reduce the statistics drastically. What are you going to do with this new information? Three things you are going to look within yourself and say, what do I carry that the world potentially needs? Question one. Question two. Are they willing to pay whatever amount of money for this solution that I carry? And question three. Where are they and how can I position myself to be the one to provide that solution for them? And irrespective of where you are now as a young undergrad, or as a graduate, wherever you are, you are not too young to start thinking like this. Because when you start thinking like this, it means that in the next couple of years, while your mates are trying to get their feet, you're already producing results as someone who is adding value actively to our economy. And since the theme of today is diversity and unity, all of us seated here, seated within us, are the different things we need to put together to build a nation that we desire. So every time you say, I want Nigeria to be better, I want Africa to be better, what you are inherently saying is, there's a part of me that I have not deployed that is making us where we are. And until you realize that if you don't get up with what you have, we don't move. So every single one of us as diverse as we are, our interconnectivity is what bets the change we ever want to see. And the time starts now because our time is ticking as a nation. And where you are seated as a young student here in this school, in any school anywhere in the world, within your student community, there's something you can start. There's a small study group. There's a small business group. There's a small brainstorming group. There's a small teaching group. There's a small product and solution you can start just so that in your own way, you have found what you can do to actively add value. And as I wrap this up, Every time you see a brother and a sister that you think has the potential to do something different and you keep quiet and not do something about it, you're probably part of our problems. What this means is that you recognize that your brother has the gift, the talent, the solution that our country needs to end corruption, giving an example, and you turn a blind eye to what he can potentially do. That's one thing being left undone. So I challenge every one of you who is seated here today to take your time and begin to observe what you can do differently, and also begin to observe the friends that you have around you to say, you have this gift. I think this gift can do this for our country. It can do this for our community. Stop sitting on it. And I'm going to leave this final thing with you. The greatest gift you can have as a person seated today and listening to me anywhere in this world is the gift of a transformed mind. 
it means that every time you're able to see a possibility of a future that exists, that is the stepping stone to birthing greatness. Greatness is not just birthed by the certification that you get, but it's by the transformation that has happened to your mind to conceive a possibility that you can be the person to birth that possibility. So I want to challenge you that every day, every week, week once a week, take out time for introspection. I like to call it solitude. It means you have a date with yourself to ask yourself questions going on inside of you. And the questions and conversations going on, going on inside of you is the key to birthing the greatness seated inside, is inside of you that is waiting to be birthed. And until that greatness is birthed, you and I will still have to wait a very long time. And I know that just by speaking to every one of us here, you are challenged to go back home and say, there's a part of me waiting but there's a part of me that because it's not being deployed, this country is the way it is. And I'm going to challenge myself to go back, do my homework, because Nigeria needs you, Africa needs you. Thank you.